Imagine a scenario where a high school teacher works with his or her students to make drugs. This might sound a little bit familiar. <laughs> Walter White was a rather unfulfilled but quite mild-mannered high school chemistry teacher who was transformed into the notorious crime lord, Heisenberg, who built this methamphetamine ring with his ex-student, Jesse. Of course, I'm talking about the hit AMC series, Breaking Bad. Now, millions of people watch this series across the globe, and lots of people illegally downloaded it, but the scenario that I'd like to talk to you about today is one that's quite different, and that's the idea of breaking good. The two molecules behind me at first might look quite different from each other. The first is Heisenberg's beloved methamphetamine. Perhaps I should have coloured it in blue. And the molecule next to it is a potential anti-malarial drug target. Now, although they look different, they're both organic molecules, and the skills required to stitch those atoms together in the right order are the same for both molecules. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, we can see some common features. For example, they both contain carbons bonded to three hydrogens. These are called methyl groups. They also both contain nitrogen. And if we look a little bit closer, we might be familiar with the benzene ring that we all love and know from high school chemistry class. Now, if we imagine what Jesse and Heisenberg could achieve with stolen chemicals in a clapped-out RV in the middle of the, net, the desert, sometimes wearing nothing but their underpants, imagine what we could achieve in a fully equipped research laboratory with access to all of the resources that these students need. Now, of course, there are some problems with working on, the, on making medicines or synthesizing drugs if you don't have the, the required experience. It can be quite dangerous. You can't just mix anything together. Some chemicals will explode, some of them will produce noxious gases, and that's something that we need to be very mindful of. There's also some other problems with being involved in a drug discovery program. And one of them is the fact that most drug discovery programs are led by the pharmaceutical industry, and they're kept entirely secret. And this means that the recipes or the procedures to make the molecules that are part of the research program don't become available, if at all, they don't become available until long after the research process has ended, so it's really hard to join in. And the reason for this secrecy is quite clear. It's really, really expensive to find a new medicine. So one of the average, averages that's given is $2.6 billion to take a medicine from its first discovery into uh, your pharmacy, so you can take it and, and receive it from your chemist. And it also takes around 12 years for that process to happen. But if we zoom in a little bit closer at these figures, we can see that around a quarter of this figure is spent on marketing. And when we compare this to the amount that's spent on research, it leads us to think that there might be something a little bit wrong with this model. Particularly when it comes to diseases that affect people in less economically developed parts of the world. This is the female Anopheles mosquito and she's about to dive in on this poor, unsuspecting victim and take a blood meal to nourish her eggs. And in this process, this is how the Anopheles mosquito transmits malaria. Now, in 2015, there were 214 million cases of malaria and 438,000 deaths. And the vast majority of those deaths were very young children. Now, there are some really, really good medicines for malaria. This example here is artemisinin, and this is a molecule that has been used in traditional Chinese medicine for around 2,000 years. And in 2015, Professor Tu Yu Yu shared part of the Nobel Prize because she had done a lot of work to discover the application of this molecule in the treatment of malaria. And at the moment, this is given with a mixture of other medicines in something called an artemisin, artemisinin combination therapy. And it's a really good medicine, but unfortunately, there are some problems. 
And that's that in five Southeast Asian countries, there's been reports of resistance to these therapies. And if this resistance spreads to sub-Saharan Africa, where the vast majority of cases are, there's going to be a real catastrophe. So we need new medicines and we need to make them very quickly. Now, if we look at this map, the areas in red display the places in the world that are at risk of malaria. And we can see that they mainly, this mainly happens in less economically developed countries. So perhaps we need to think about a new model to try and find medicines for malaria. And one of these could be open source drug discovery. So the idea of open source is familiar to most of us in the guise of software. Many of you will have used Firefox this morning or have Linux on your computers at home. And most of us have used Wikipedia, I, I dare add. Um, maybe not just to cheat in pub quizzes, but it's a very useful resource. And the way that these things work is that people donate their ideas, their codes freely, and anyone can use these platforms. And this idea of open source has been adapted by scientists in a variety of different projects where they've encouraged people, members of the public, to contribute to real research programs and make real differences. And this idea of open science was taken on board by Associate Professor Math Matthew Todd at the University of Sydney when in 2011 he founded the Open Source Malaria Consortium after gaining some funding from the Medicines for Malaria Venture, who are an NGO who look after all of the um, global research for malaria worldwide, and also the Australian government. And that's where I've worked for the last four years. Now, we are a, in many ways, like a traditional uh, drug discovery program in that we're trying to find new medicines, but there are some very big differences. And they are mainly that we share all of our data online and in real time, and anybody can use it. There's not going to be any patents, and we want people to use that data. Now, in 2010, a pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, did something extraordinary. They searched through two million of their compounds that they keep in these vast libraries of molecules that they've made for many different disease areas. And what they did is that they screened these against the malaria parasite, and they found that about 13,500 of these molecules were really good at killing the malaria parasite. And rather than keeping this data secret, they published this in a landmark paper and invited scientists from around the world to use some of these molecules to develop drug discovery programs. And so, after some consultation with the community and some experts in medicinal chemistry, we used this paper as a starting point for some of our own research. And as I mentioned before, we share this. So rather than us keeping our lab book entries in dusty lab books that sometimes get lost or forgotten in the labs around the world, we keep our lab book online in essentially a blog that anybody can access. We also really try to avoid email. So rather than um, emailing different members of the project, we have our online our discussions online so that anyone can see and interact with what's being discussed at the pro in the project at any one time. And after this many you know, conversations and suggestions and some really hard uh, hours of work in the lab, we make molecules and we send those out to the biologists who work as part of the project so that they can test them and tell us how good or bad they are at killing the malaria parasite. We also, as part of the Open Source Malaria Project, recently wrote a proposal for something called the Science Introduction Robot, or CINDER. And it's sort of like a Tinder for scientists. <laughs> but rather than you know, trying to find the person of your dreams, you can swipe, you, we, the idea is that you could swipe right to find somebody who's got a rather attractive collaboration that you'd like to join in with. So there are so many people working as part of this project. We recently published a paper that had over 50 authors from nine different countries on it. So there's lots of people working on this, chem informaticians, scientists, chemists, biologists. But not all of these people have a PhD. And not all of them are working towards having a PhD. And that's great. Some of the people in this project are undergraduate students. Now, chemistry is a practical subject. And that means that as much as you absorb the theory and the, the beautiful theory that is a part of chemistry, 
you can't get too far in your studies without really getting your hands dirty or maybe not getting your hands dirty, maybe putting some gloves on and keeping them clean in the lab, but going to do some experiments. And one of the things that's frustrated me since I was an undergraduate is that we'd spend weeks, hours each week in the lab, slaving away and trying to make these molecules, you know, tying these atoms together. And then at the end of the lab course, we'd give these samples in to be assessed. And when we'd got our mark, they'd be thrown into the bin. What a waste of time. What a waste of resources. We need to get these students making something that's actually useful. And that's where open source drug discovery came in. Back in 2012, there was one afternoon, I think it was a rainy afternoon, and I was in the lab, and I was obviously feeling a little bit dismayed with the chemistry, and we hadn't got to three important molecules. So I used my obviously brilliant design skills, <laughs> I think you can see where I'm lacking here, to design a wanted poster um, to put out on Twitter. And um, much to our delight, somebody responded to this wanted poster. A scientist in Edinburgh, Dr. Patrick Thompson, said, I can make these molecules with some undergraduate students who are working in my lab. And lo and behold, they synthesized these molecules. And because we're an open project, they could publish these spectra. They might look a bit strange behind me, but these are sort of the, the evidence that they'd actually made the molecule they set out to make. And we could all look at it together on Twitter and point out, you know, it's got all the right peaks. It looks like you've made the right molecule. And then Patrick was able to send them to a local testing site in Dundee and get the data back. Now, actually, these molecules weren't active at all. And that might sound a little bit disappointing, but it really isn't because that's a very important part of the drug discovery process. We need to know the bits of the molecule that matter when it comes to killing the parasite. So by learning which bits are good and which bits are bad, it means that the next iteration of our design can be much better. Next to join in was Stefan Debert, who is in the US at Lawrence University. He and a class of 40 undergraduate students synthesized six brand new molecules which were actually really good at killing the malaria parasite. Unfortunately, there was a problem with their solubility, and this means that they wouldn't be very good medicines. But they were really, really good at killing a particular stage of the, the malaria life cycle that's quite tricky to kill. And because all of their data is online and freely available, if somebody comes along and finds out a way to improve the solubility of those molecules, they are welcome to that data, and so it's not going to be lost. And closer to home, my first year class at the University of Sydney over the past two years have made eight new malaria compounds. And these are first year students. For some of them, this is their first experience of doing some work in a chemistry lab and look what they've achieved. And one of these molecules is really looking rather good. It's very active and we're very excited to see the results of some of the newer biological tests regarding this molecule. Now, this approach is not just limited to malaria or indeed to undergraduate students. There is one single molecule that links all of the images on this slide. First up, we've got Gertrude Elion. She was a Nobel Prize winning American scientist. Next, we have Martin Shkreli, who's the ex-CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals. Then we've got Hillary who I was hoping to introduce as president-elect today, but less of that. And we have the emblem of a local high school, Sydney Grammar. Now, the molecule that links all of these images is Daropram. So Daropram was actually originally designed for the treatment of malaria, but it's now one of the World Health Organization's essential medicines for the treatment of another parasite, and that's Toxoplasmosis gondii. Now, toxoplasmosis is mainly innocuous for healthy individuals, but it can be very dangerous for certain groups of people, such as pregnant women or those who are living with a com condition that um, compromises their immune system, such as HIV or AIDS. And then we get on to exhibit B, Martin Shkreli. This molecule might be ringing a bell for some of you, and that would be because Martin Shkreli hiked the price of this medicine after obtaining the market rights for the medicine from $13.50 a dose to $750 a dose. And that's where Hillary came in. 
she was, along with many others, outraged and she publicly called him out and asked for reform in this area. So we thought, what if we were to get a local high school to be engaged in a really interesting research project where they tried to make this medicine? Perhaps we could highlight some of the flaws in the system. And so that's what the students at Sydney Grammar School are doing now. These young scientists are making great progress. They're already one step in, they've made an intermediate, there's a couple of steps to go. But with the help of their wonderful teachers, Malcolm Binns, Erin Sheridan and Trent Wallace, perhaps they can make this medicine and highlight the problems that have been involved with this drug and really show that there are some people who can't get access to a medicine that they really need. And maybe we could cheer up Hillary too. So there are lots of different universities and schools that have joined, well, lots of different universities that have joined the school and university in Australia. We're now working with people in the United States, in the UK and New Zealand. And I really hope that many other institutions will join the Open Source Malaria Project or start projects of their own. Open source, dis open source drug discovery provides a unique opportunity for undergraduates and high school students to be engaged in a real research project whilst learning the essential skills to become good scientists. And if we could, you know, get into this untapped resource and mobilise the Walter Whites from different institutions around the world, not the Heisenbergs, please, to work with groups of students to make medicines, think of what we could achieve. If we work together and we share our data and, I and if we work together and we share our data and our ideas, perhaps we could find a new medicine for malaria and much more quickly and much more cheaply. The time is now for breaking good.